Um, today we are interviewing um, Adam Danko. So, hello Adam. Hi, how are you? I'm doing good, thanks. I hope you're doing good too. Yeah, I am, thank you. <laughs> Very good. Um, so, this time we are not having video because Adam doesn't have a webcam available. So, but anyway, I will demonstrate some things and he will explain some things on the fly. So, it's um, worth watching the stream anyway. <clears throat> so, the interesting thing here is that um, usually we, we interview inventors and pioneers who actually did invent something in the past. And the special thing about Adam is that Adam is not only the youngest one that we ever interviewed, but he is also creating kind of the f future right now at the moment. <laughs> uh, not not only not only he did in the, in the past, so um, so maybe maybe you could introduce yourself a bit to our watchers and readers, who you are exactly. Certainly. So I my name is Adam Dunkels. I am uh, the CEO and co-founder of ThinkSquare, which is the company that I and uh, uh, together with two co-founders are building, actually around the software that I originally wrote for the Commodore 64 uh, some over 10 years ago now. Well, actually, I didn't originally write for the Commodore 64, but it turned out to be uh, one of the platforms that was uh, supported from the start. Uh, is, and this the software called Contiki, an operating system for various very resource-constrained devices that are uh, that we are currently using it for things like light bulbs, street lights, thermostats, um, uh, equipment that, that we use in buildings to turn on the, uh, the heating uh, and turn on the cooling, that kind of things. And uh, that software also runs on the Commodore 64, which is, I guess, one of the kind of the background to this, this conversation we're having today is, uh, is this connection to the, to the past and, and to the future. Uh, we're using this in something, something that we call the Internet of Things, which is one of the catchphrases of, uh, uh, I guess, the decade. Uh, it's been up and coming over the, the uh, past few years and has now really gone onto the mainstream radar. So I guess what we could say is that we are doing now what people were doing in the late 70s in terms of doing something with, with the emerging technology at the time, that was home computers and computers in general. And we're sort of seeing the same type of development happening, happening right now, but in a completely different field, much, much larger. This is something that will affect us all in one way or another. We can connect smartphones and smartphone apps to, the, uh, uh, to the, our physical environment and, and into the real world. Well, this is what you basically do. Um, how did you actually come to to um, invent something and to become, well, a person who who's going to be into um, electronics and internet and communication? I mean, we are talking here about things that that has been here, like internet protocol and so on, since the 70s or 80s or something. So, how did you get the? How did you get into the? Um, computer industry and all this um, internet protocol stuff? How did you find your way in? Sure, I, I guess I yeah, started as a kid, I guess as, as most of us did, uh, programming away at computers and, and having fun uh, doing that. Uh, of course, the Commodore 64 was one of my, uh, well, my platforms that, that I, I, was, I was doing that with as a kid and as a teenager. And I always had a lot of fun with that and with, with the people around the platform. Of course, a lot of people uh, were, were doing the same thing. And we, we got together and, and uh, we were showing off our demos to each other and so forth. And uh, so that was the kind of the background to everything. And, and as, I were, as I was studying computer science at the university and did my master thesis, what we did in my master thesis was... Uh, Connecting wireless sensors and ice hockey players to make them talk to uh, to to uh, 
computers and, and handheld devices that people had at ringside. And uh, one of the very cool things that we did in this project was using the internet protocols to do this. We got the wireless ice hockey player sensors talking the same language as the internet did. And uh, I, I was kind of fascinated by this idea that you could, could actually put something uh, out there that could connect to the internet, which would make it able to talk to everything. In fact, the whole wide world, if you wish. Even though you might want to do that at ringside, want to be very physically close, you still got the opportunity, the ability to do this, to communicate with everything. And uh, I was working at the time in academia uh, at a uh, national research institute here in, in Stockholm, Sweden. And uh, uh, working with the software, kept, kept developing it, reduces open source. And uh, uh, a lot of people started using it. People started putting this, this software into you know, a, a large number of different types of devices. We saw it used for, for things like uh, uh, film equipment, the, the equipment that was uh, part of the, the uh, I think one of the uh, Lord of the Rings movies was, was somehow uh, post-produced using this equipment, using my software and so forth. So for, for a number of years, people were using this, and, and that, was, that was pretty cool to see that happening. And uh, uh, so pe people were asking me about, is it possible to make this even smaller? The software it was, it was the, the microprocessors that the people were putting in products were, they needed to have smaller microprocessors to make them uh, fit into even more objects and even more things. Uh, so I, I did an even smaller version of this called MicroIP. Also got a pretty good uh, distribution in terms of people using it for various embedded style systems. And uh, uh, so that's kind of the background leading up to, uh, I guess, making the connection back to the Commodore 64 happened sometime in 2002 when a friend of mine, Peter uh, Eliason, and, and me sat, sat down together over a couple of lunches and discussed the uh, opportunity of making an Ethernet card for the Commodore 64. We, uh, we had been using the Commodore 64 as, as teenagers and, and sort of worked on that together and we thought, no, let's do this, let's, let's do an Ethernet card for the Commodore 64. And we uh, sat down and, and looked at it and it seemed to be not that hard actually. It was a pretty, pretty straightforward thing to do. Uh, so we did that. And we, we talked about how to make this even cooler. I mean, an Ethernet card is just a piece of hardware. So we, th we thought, you know, maybe we could use the cassette player to uh, stream audio. Just put a tape in there and stream audio. And we did that. It turned out to be possible. And it sounded really, really bad. Really bad. Horribly bad. But it did work. <laughs> so, so we did have a, a Commodore 64 web server that you could you actually go to this with your web browser, click the uh, streaming audio button, and get a live feed from the cassette player. <laughs> and, uh, and people were doing this. We had, I, I think, something like 60,000 visitors the first day when we put this on live. Really <laughs> tremendously popular. And the Commodore 64 server did hold up to the load. It was pretty impressive. We added some, some nice tweaks to it to, uh, to make sure that it would sustain uh, some pretty harsh load, and it did. And uh, that was, that, so that was kind of the, what led up to the whole uh, Contiki thing that, that came around later. So it all started with that ice hockey monitoring project. Well, yeah, that or, 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 or the Commodore 64 as a, as a kid. I guess depending on what, where you choose to see it starting, but yeah, I <laughs> something see. like that. So, it, so that project was kind of what we know um, from Formula One racers, where, where um, like a headquarter has sensor information from the car and the driver and so on. And is this kind of a similar thing for the ice hockey players, or that, how is how is how is comparable? Yeah, that's right. Something like that. It was uh, we were. You know, this was right at the end of the first IT boom, the dot com boom, uh, where everyone was really excited over this new technology and what you could do with that. And uh, but everything was very very new. So for this project, we had just gotten the first uh, Bluetooth chips, the first versions of the chips that came out uh, in the late 1999. 
they were so early that they didn't even have a, the plastic casing that you normally have on a computer chip. It was just a bare guy that was the that we had to solder this on by hand, and, and that was really tricky to get this working. Uh, so we had Bluetooth uh, and a, as a way to, to get these sensors to communicate. And I think that was, uh, I mean, this was very very early. This was was like 14 years ago now, and and uh, now I think they have this on on a lot of sports teams. I think you know Formula One certainly has it. I think. Uh, American football has it, where you can see the, the live stats from the players. I guess at least the the coaches can see this. Uh, but but this was a very early project. We, we made it work, but but there was one match I think was played with the the equipment used by the players, and uh, the uh, <laughs> they had to wear a, uh, a a number of things on their on their uh, on their outfits. So. They had a pulse belt around their, their waist, which was, uh, I don't know how fun, fun that was. Uh, they had a camera on their helmets. Some of the players had cameras on their helmets. And uh, what they did not want to have was a microphone. Uh, I guess they didn't want a permanent record of what they were saying out there when they were playing the match. So, but they had a number of sensors on. It was pretty cool to see. So you actually started with that um, with that ice hockey monitoring when there was this internet or dot com boom and that is that the contiguous thing started in 2002 that was right after the um, dot com bubble crash kind of didn't make, yeah. it, didn't make it difficult to start a bold project like micro um, internet protocol and so on in such a moment where everybody is disappointed by how how well how bad it all turned out with that dot com bubble? Uh, yeah, I think this the the project that we had at the at my university was uh, uh, was intended to be put, be uh, be a second uh, run of the project that was cancelled because everything just crashed. So it sort of stopped there, and uh, I think for for a while this was. I mean, again, people were very enthusiastic about this because it, it, there was new technology in 1999 and, and the year 2000 people were really excited and I think what happened was that over the, the upcoming years people were becoming less and less excited of the technology as, as such and it's still what's happening now is that we see people are, are building things and doing things and, and seeing things not as technology, but rather the technology is just a part of that larger something. It's I, I think that that what happened was after the dot com crash, the excitement of technology sort of went out of fashion for a while. And I think that was a good thing because uh, if you're really excited about a new technology, you you probably won't hit the right thing because you're aiming for something that's that's wrong. And uh, I think what, what, what we're seeing now is that the technology excitement is sort of lower, but the technology is much more evolved. And everything has happened over, over these, well, 15 years, uh, sort of silently. We've, we haven't, <clears throat> we maybe have, we have seen the results. We have, I mean, we all have smartphones. We all have internet connectivity. That didn't exist back then in this, in this uh, way. But it's not technology driven and it's not excitement in the same way. It's not, it's not the same kind of, uh, we don't look at technology as, as the new thing that will save us, but we, we just use it. I think that's a good thing. Now the question is, talking about Kontiki, um, when, you, when you Google for Kontiki, you kind of um, hit, well, you kind of hit web pages that show the Contiki with a with a graphical user interface and multitasking and even a screensaver and it's looking it's looking quite like Windows, colorful and prideful on the Commodore 64. Yeah. Um, but but if you look closer, um, if there's a page you have um, Contiki running on an emulator. Let me see if I can find it. Um, it's something like 
like a network emulation of Contiki. So Conti Contiki is not really the operating system, but just a network protocol that is underlying it, the network communication you do? Or ha how is it to, to understand, actually? Well, right. So Contiki is really the operating system that, that runs on, uh, on, the ac on, the, on the microprocessor. So the, uh, the screenshot I think you're thinking about is the network simulator that we have. So we can, we can simulate, that's called Kuja, so we can simulate large networks of Contiki devices all running the Contiki OS. And uh, the protocol that they are using is really just Internet Protocol version 6. Uh, we do have version 4 as well, so, so we can connect to, to the Internet. Uh, and we can connect to the IPv6 Internet if we'd like to. So, so the uh, Contiki is, is an operating system that uh, controls the hardware, that controls the uh, uh, communication, controls the, uh, um, uh, the programs running on the, uh, on the microcontroller or the microprocessor. So it does all these things for, for that program. And one of the things that we have focused on uh, very heavily over the past two years is making the communication work really, really well so that you can make these large networks of, uh, of Contiki devices. We're putting this in, in things like streetlights where you really need to have a large network of wireless, uh, self-configured network of, of, de of devices. Right, so what we're seeing here on screen is the uh, Kuja simulator being started inside the Instant Contiki virtual machine, which is a single file download that contains all the, the compilers and tools you need to get Contiki running. And uh, what, we're, what we're seeing is now uh, the uh, Kuja uh, interface. And uh, I think if you scroll down a few more pages, you should see a screenshot of what it looks like when we have a number of these simulated nodes. Right there, I, I think we saw that. Uh, right, yes, that's one. We see a number of these Contiki simulated nodes talking to each other in a, in a simulated wireless medium, uh, a radio medium. And the arrows are representing the, the messages being sent from the node right there in the middle to the other ones around it. So this is a tool where we can build uh, and, and test a large network, a large wireless network, uh, seeing how the, the self-forming protocols make the network work. And we can, we can see things like what the performance is, how reliable is the network, and we can feed that back into a real deployment, a real system uh, running on actual hardware. And uh, we don't need to go out and build the hardware first, but we can test the, the system right here on our, on our screen and see how, it, how well it performed before we take it to hardware. So Kucha is the network simulation for Contiki. That's right. And Contiki is the whole ass with the GUI and so on. That's right. So we do have the graphical user interface. So the, uh, <clears throat> what we are, uh, originally the graphical user interface was sort of a, sort of a, a, a fun project for me. I just sort of put that together uh, so that we could run this on various machines like the Commodore 64. Uh, in fact, one of the, like the like origins... Like right. Like, like here, this screen. Let's see if we can find some screens here. Yeah, I think so I see... If, this, oh, yeah. This would be something like what you see in the Commodore 64. That's right. I think the screenshot that I see, there's a big Commodore logo that seems like someone going to a web page and actually looking at that through the Commodore. Oh, yeah, look at that. Pretty cool. Through the Commodore 64 version of the Contiki uh, system with the graphical user interface and its web browser. And, uh, in fact, the, uh, the, the web browser was uh, the origin of the name also. The, the name Contiki came out of this web browser. And uh, it's, it's, it refers to the... Uh, there was a raft by a Norwegian guy called Carl, uh, called uh, Heidel, who uh, who built a raft to show that the uh, uh, back in the day, the people living in uh, I think 
South America were able to sail across the Pacific Ocean to reach the Polynesian Islands. And uh, he's, he set out to prove that Bill and, uh, doing this tiny, tiny raft uh, with this ancient technology, they could actually sail the oceans and, and, and do something that well, people just didn't think was possible. So the, that, was, and that raft was named Kantiki. So I took the name Kantiki to the system here uh, as a reference to this because at the time there were a bunch of web browsers out there that had names like Navigator, Explorer, Conqueror, you know, these big pompous names of big, you know, you, you imagine big boats and, and, and navigating and exploring the world. So he would be the tiny little raft built using ancient technology, the Commodore 64, but still being out there and, and actually looking at websites and, and, and working on the internet. So that's the origin of the name Kentiki. And uh, so Kentiki can run a graphical user interface if you have a screen connected to your device like you have in a Commodore 64. But we're also running the same, the same graphical user interface on uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, hardware kits that we are using with, with FaceSquared uh, today. We're actually using the same graphical user interface on a small LCD screen on these, uh, on these uh, hardware devices that we sell as part of our uh, Internet of Things kits. So, so the, the, uh, it's very versatile in that sense. We can use it for a lot of different things. So the question is for me, um, you said you started, as, you started in a Commodore 64, but, but if you read the Wikipedia, for example, um, or your homepage, you can also read about, well, it's small enough to even work on a Game Boy or something, which is right. really incredible. So, yeah. um, how did it start to become so huge? And um, were the ports also done by you or by other people? Or how did you even notice that now, now, now my fun project is growing into something um, big, something huge? I mean, Contiki is available for so many platforms, and it's, it's really incredible. Yeah, I, I think I, I actually set out to, I, before announcing the project, before announcing this to the world at all, I did talk to a lot of people who were, who were working on different platforms and different hardware, and asked them if they were interested in, in you know, helping out with this project, because I, I had a system that was fully written in C, so it, well, there was no machine-specific code in there. It would work on a range of different platforms, as long as you had a C compiler. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, uh, so I, I got in touch with a pretty large group of people, some 10 to 15 uh, persons uh, that I had, I had met online through various forums. Uh, and, uh, you know, asked them, are you interested in, in helping out with this? And, and they were very interested in doing that. So we had, really from the start, a number of people who ported this to a, a whole bunch of different platforms. Uh, the first one, I think, we had Commodore 64 support, VIC-20, Apple II. I'm not sure if we had Apple II from the start or if that came in later. Uh, we had a, very, a number of... Uh, Z80 based platforms. We had a number of embedded platforms uh, like the H8S platform, that was a Hitachi uh, based embedded systems platform. And uh, over the, the first year alive, the project also added a number of, of other embedded platforms like the Ethanol AVR, and the Texas Instruments MSB430, uh, just because it was so easy to port. Uh, the system. It was fully written in C. It was pretty easy to get a grasp on the full system at the time. It was, it was very small and simple. And so someone could just take uh, the, I think that were something like four or five functions that you had to implement uh, to port the system to a new platform. And they could have a basic system up and running. You needed a clock, you needed a, a way to get input and output into and out of the system. And uh, if you wanted the graphical user interface, you also needed to implement one function that would print a letter on the screen somewhere. And once you had that, you'd actually have the system up and running. So, so m making it portable, I think, was key to this. 
the other thing is, um, well, so my question is, how did you actually do the web browser? Because you're not the first one who did a web browser that was traffic based. And um, for example, for the C64, Maurice Randall did something called the Wave. Yeah. Um, in 1997 already, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So did you did you use other um, did you use this web browser or Lynx, for example, for the PC, which is even older? Did you use other text-based browsers as a role-playing model for making your text-based browser, or did you do it all from scratch? Because you're no, not this <laughs> right. No, I, I think this was actually the first uh, web browser for the Commodore 64. I think there were a couple of ones before. Like there was on you mentioned the wave. I think that was written for for something called the super CPU, which was a uh, another CPU uh, that was much larger, much faster, that's, and much more that's memory. That's true. That's true. That so, was for the um, for the turbo for the turbo based well right um, yes. kind of card from CMD. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, so that was that was a different thing. Uh, I think there was someone who did a a, a real web browser. Later for the Commodore 64 that had support even for CSS, uh, but but that came in later. And I think that that was something really really cool. I, it, I actually I'm not sure if that was just a a way to, to render HTML or if it actually it actually had the Internet Protocol as as well. I'm not sure, but I think Contigo was the first. Uh, and the uh, the web browser is really super super simple. It's uh, the the uh, I think this the absolutely simplest way of making an HTML parser uh, that that just reads byte by byte from the TCP stream and tries to do something useful with it. So super super simple does not do much more than well I, I think it, it does a few basic formatting things like headers and and uh, paragraphs uh, forms as well so that you could you can actually use it to use Google with it in the first uh, version of it. But, but very, very simple. I will, I will include a video, and then people will see actually that it's, well, the page is crawling and building up line by line, kind of. Like That's the right. old packet radio days. Yeah. So this is, oh, why, yeah. this is why it is that way, because you read it byte by byte. Yes, and it's, it's really slow. The, the parser is super slow. And on the Commodore 64, this is good, because that means that you can you can just scroll it and show this to the to the user as the page is, is rendered, and uh, if you click, there is a I think you see that in the screenshot right here. There is a stop button and a down button. So what happens is if you click the stop button, it would just stop rendering the the uh, the, uh, the HTML and it would close the connection and uh, just stop and show what, it, what the last thing it saw. And if you click the down button, the uh, browser will connect to the website, uh, web server again, and read out as many bytes as it did the last time, not rendering them at all, and then start rendering, rendering again once it sort of reached the end of the of the screen and keeps scrolling that upwards. So it's sort of scrolling slowly, just because the renderer is so slow. This is probably done because of also. Um Speed and RAM limitations, I guess. Yes, yeah, because everything had to fit into the memory. Uh, there wasn't much. There wasn't much space for for optimizations. You know, it was super optimized for for size. And oh, also, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah, it's also written in C, which has a, a, a an overhead in terms of size. If if you take the same idea and write it in an assembly language, that would be faster and smaller, but that would take Forever, <laughs> yes, to do so. So, and it wouldn't be as portable. So you wrote even the Contiki 64 version in in C. I mean, yeah. there is a C compiler for the C64. Yes. And you used exactly this one that is available. Yes, the CC uh, 65. Wow. C compiler. So actually, actually, you 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 programmed a big project using that compiler. That it, wasn't yeah. that wasn't known so much before. That's, okay. that's some good kind of information. And now you mentioned at the at the beginning of the interview that you also thought about the network card. So if I'm not right. mistaken, 
um, at least I got it from Jens Schoenfeld, individual computers. Right. Who did design the the um, the card, or at least well manufactured it. Right. Yes. And so, you uh, also wrote the drivers to it. So yeah. How did how did that business happen? I mean, I remember I remember like uh, five years ago, six years ago, I bought the hardware. And first, I needed, I needed a retro replay for for 50 euros. Then I needed a network interface card for 50 euros. This is quite expensive. And then you also right. need a, then you also need a router because the because the network interface uh, well the network interface card well it's not coming with a DHCP client. So you have to have. Um, well, you have to have a router to give a static IP address to the card and so on. So, I mean, isn't this kind of crazy? I mean, how did you start with this? I mean, it's hard to believe that, that anybody would say, oh, this is, this is costing us so much. So, no problem, let's do it. Well, <laughs> well, we built the first version, so we did actually, I guess that costed more for us than, than, the, than the ready-made product because we had to buy all the chips and solder it. And we, we had to print our own circuit board uh, to make it work, of course. Uh, so we did, and I, actually I think Antiki, the first version, did support DHCP, so uh, you could actually use that with, with the Ethernet card directly. Uh, but the uh, idea of the Ethernet card, I think, came from seeing that it wasn't so hard to build an Ethernet card anymore. There were chips that did most of the work. and. Uh, you you pretty much had to write a s relatively simple driver for the Ethernet card, and of course you had to write the whole IP stack on top of that. Well, we did have that already. Uh, I, I could just take the micro IP stack that I had, had working on it, on all these embedded systems and put that on the Commodore 64. So the uh, the original idea was just uh, you know, can we do it? And it turned out that we could do it. So we did it. <laughs> we just put it together. And I think a, a, a lot of people then uh, used, I think, the same controller chip that we used and, uh, and, and built you know, real products that they would sell with this one. So, and I think the, the uh, retro replay network card had a, uh, it had the same, uh, the same controller chip, but, but was mapped slightly differently. So. You'd have to have a, a different, uh, a different uh, uh, driver to use that with. Oh, look at that! That's the prototype, the final that's, Ethernet. That's right, the first one. Yeah. Oh right. Yes, and if you can see, yeah, Jens felt Jens Schoenfeld did the final production then. Um, so tell me, how did you how did you come up with doing business with um, Jens Schoenfeld? Well, I, I think he, there wasn't much business. He would just uh, he would just build the card and sell it. I mean, we we just did that for fun. So uh, there wasn't really any business involved there. Uh, there it, the idea is just you, know, you could take an Ethernet chip, put it on a on a card that you could uh, use. Through the cartridge port, and uh, they—that's it. <laughs> they can use that and do cool stuff with it. So, so you actually uh, you actually approached Jens and asked him if he if he could if he would do it or no no he he he, uh, he approached us and just asked him do you have an objection to to do this so we said of course not no do this <laughs> it's great and uh, and it did and that was really cool. So, so you announced the idea. He saw your prototype, and he asked you if he may, if he may, if he may do the production. And then you, then you wrote the drivers for it afterwards, kind of this well, way. No, I mean we had the drivers, we had everything working. So it was, uh, it was a matter of, of building the hardware, which he did, and uh, get that in to the hands of people. And the, everything was ready. We did have the software. We did have the drivers. The uh, his card used the same chip as our card, so it wasn't a matter of doing anything really. It was just a matter of we had to tweak one of the address settings of the of the driver. That was it. Then fully compatible with with our hardware. 
Well, the the only difference between the b between the RRNet card and normal Ethernet card is you only support 10 megabits per second. I think that's because of part of a limitation of the buffer kind of. Well, that was that is a a limitation of the Ethernet controller chip that we used. It's called the CC 8900A, uh, and that was only supported only worked with a 10 uh, megabits. Uh, connection. I see. So, what what was the biggest problem in well taking all the internet protocol stuff and redesigning it? I think it was kind of I guess re re engineering. Well, yeah. I think one of the main problems was that the idea of the internet protocols were that most people had was that they were something very large and and, and heavyweight. And I think the the problem was really to think think of them differently. Think of them as something pretty simple, and build the whole thing from bottom up. Instead of thinking of this as a top down problem, you can think of it as a bottom up problem. You look at how the, the communication actually works, and once you see this uh, in that light, it's not that hard anymore to take the full internet stack and put that onto something very very simple. Because the stack in itself is, I mean, the, the protocols themselves aren't that complicated. It's the, the idea, of, uh, the, the way that you think of them is what makes them complicated. So if you just see them as something pretty simple, you can implement the whole stack from the bottom up and you get a, a pretty simple piece of software that does all these complex things like well, the internet protocols, but the software itself isn't that complex. So this is how you did it. You you, you took an, a different approach compared to what people usually see. Yeah. So so despite despite there was not much much memory available back then, it it was still possible to to shrink and make it more efficient. Yeah. So. So your your internet protocol, your I think it's called um, micro IP, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Yes. Yeah. That's the. So yeah. it's actually it's actually way smaller than the regional one. Well, it's it's really the same protocols. It's it's the same. Uh, there is no change to the actual protocols. They they are the same, and that's the beauty of it, because uh, you can just take this. You know, you take your Commodore 64. This Ethernet card, you put it online, and the rest of the internet won't know the difference from you know. It's just it's just another internet protocol computer. Uh, there there's no there's no ch change to the protocols. The only change is the the way that they are implemented. So the code, the software, is is just very simple, and uh, the protocols themselves do what they do. Uh, it's the only difference is the way that the software is structured, and um, so that's that's the beauty of it. You don't really need to have a there is no there is no new protocol in there. You don't need to reinvent something or do something very new uh, that wouldn't work. If you do that, you could do that, of course, and, and you'd have to, to design something that would translate between your protocol and the rest of the internet, which would somehow defeat the purpose of connecting things to the internet because. You're not, you not. You still have to connect this other thing as well, and uh, but but having the ability to just take something, whatever it is, and put it on the internet is, is very very powerful, and that's really the, the where we wanted to go with it, with all this, is is not be reliant on something, on another piece of, of hardware or software, that you need to maintain and upgrade and and, and deal with, uh, but really to to put these things directly onto the internet and make life a lot easier for a lot of people. But you didn't stop there. You 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 didn't only do a, a web browser or something. You also did a VNC client, a VNC server, and yeah. um, as I as I mentioned earlier, like screensaver and that fun stuff. Right. I mean, yeah. I mean, wasn't that I mean was that even necessary? I mean, you did more than it was. 
<laughs> that's every kind of yeah well, yeah I guess you know, strictly speaking none of this is, is very necessary <laughs> so especially back then before the Commodore 64 none of that was really strictly speaking necessary that was that was mostly done for fun I mean the whole internet protocols the micro IP stuff that is that is very very, very serious and, and very useful but mo most of the Commodore 64 stuff was, was really just made for fun and uh, the uh, the VNC client, the VNC server, I did to to see how well the uh, because that's a pretty complex piece of software. And I wanted to see how easy or hard it would be to write that on top of the the uh, abstractions provided by the MicroID stack. And it turned out to be relatively hard. It they it, it, it was a bit harder than what you'd like to have. Uh, it, it took some effort to actually make that work. Uh, so. The outcome of that experiment was that, you, I mean, even though you could do this, you could put all this software, all this internet software, onto this very, very tiny uh, piece of machinery, uh, and it, 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 you probably need more horsepower, just a bit more, to make something more useful out of it. You could, you could have something con connected to the internet and do some simple stuff. Uh, but if you wanted to, to, to do a bit more complex things, maybe you'd have a uh, uh, you'd get more out of, the, of your system by adding a bit more horsepower and being able to use more, uh, let's say, useful abstractions than what the, the original MicroID stack provided. But the uh, the uh, screensaver, all that was just for fun, <laughs> and it was pretty cool though. <laughs> I mean, it was it was it, it really worked and. I think you could have a you could have a, a Commodore 64 with a web server on it. So you'd have the web server application on it, serving files from the uh, disk drive, and so you could see if you could look at a website from the disk drive of the Commodore 64 and ha and have the screensaver running at the same time. So that was just for fun. That was just a very cool thing to see. So, so and it wasn't that hard to make it work either. I mean, the system was supported, so so it had all the basics of the system already. So it was more just a very cool thing to have. So, but you could also say you could also say you made the kind of first multi real multitasking operating system on the sixty four. Well, uh, I, I, people had done that before. Uh, a lot of people had done that. So it, it's not that was not a super new thing at the time. Uh, the new thing was really the, the, the internet communication. Well, but, but if you compare to G or something that is like way, way earlier, yeah. yours, yours is a lot, lot faster than what, what we used to see before. Okay, cool. I haven't actually used GEOS, so <laughs> I, I wouldn't know. But, but there were, they were, <clears throat> they were something called Ludix that was written by a guy called Daniel uh, Dalma, I think, who had uh, done something like a, a very, very simple Unix-style system for the Commodore 64 that I, I saw that. That was maybe 1996, 1997. Uh, I, I remember seeing that and got very inspired by the idea of, of doing an operating system for the Commodore 64, but I, I didn't do it at, well, I did actually do an a very simple operating system at the time. Uh, like 97, 98 sometime, uh, with, with multitasking and stuff. So a lot of people have done that before, Kentucky. That was not, not very new, but, but it's cool to hear that, that Kentucky is faster than Geos. That, that was great. I didn't know that. Well, um, Geos was so slow, it, it was, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't use it without a RAM, RAM, expan RAM expansion with a ROI or without a super CPU. I mean... Oh. It's it's really very slow because it constantly loads from the um, disk drive. You see oh. every single program and so on, and it has a lot of well big loading times. Well, there wasn't a really um, fast fast loader in it like it is in Kentucky. Um, right. So now now thing is you you also started up your own company called ThingSquare, where you. That's right. Where you actually sell kits, where people could use them to connect simple household devices like light bulbs or a toaster to the internet and to control it. 
remote control it, something like that. Well, yeah. What we what we're really selling is uh, the software that that connects these things to uh, to the uh, cloud. I mean, to, to a cloud backend, so that you can have uh, devices controlled from anywhere. But more importantly, you have an easy way to control them from things like smartphone apps, uh, from things like backend server control centers. You could you, know, you use the same backend software, and then we have the open source. Kentucky OS running on the devices themselves. So right, so we see here on the screen two of our uh, early customers that we have using the uh, the Facebook system, which is based on Kentucky, and uh, uh, both of these are uh, examples of products where you'd have a smartphone app talking to uh, a thing like the uh, the light bulb to the right or to a, a thermostat to the left. So. Uh, you'd have a, a, a the, the reason why you like to do this is you take the Tano system for example there is a you have the app with you all the time and the app knows where you are so that when you're on your way home the heating system in your home can start to heat up or cool down already when you're starting your, your journey and uh, uh, that way you, you get a uh, comfortable indoor uh, environment and you save power. So it's a, it's a pretty powerful thing. And uh, it's enabled by the fact that you can connect your anything, and in this case, your, your heater, to the internet. And they have your smartphone app, which, well, a smartphone app always connects to the internet. That's what they do. So you have this, this connection. And uh, enabled by the fact that you have a, a way to connect to the internet easily from a uh, a small chip that you just put in in your heater uh, connection box, and uh, the uh, the light bulb light fix to the right is, is similar. Uh, again, you have a wireless connection to anything. In this case, a light bulb that can connect directly to a smartphone app, and you can set your your uh, RGB LED light from your smartphone. Uh, very convenient. You don't you don't need to have a, a special Kind of controller, uh, handheld remote to do that. You just use your smartphone. Uh, again, enabled by the fact that you can you can talk to anything from uh, by just putting a chip in there. Talk to anything and then talk to uh, and turn that into a smartphone app. And the cool thing here is that both you know both of these sub systems that we see here are based on the Kentucky OS, so it's Kentucky running on them. So. So was it actually planned since the beginning to to be a big thing, or I, I think not, right? Because you you thought about the idea how to make well how to make internet on the C64, how to make it possible, and how to make an operating system that that can handle internet on the C64, and the the idea to create a company and while well, selling kits and using it in pro in, um, well in products like. Um, time of tapes or light bulbs. I think that came came later at some point. Well, I actually, I, I uh, uh, it wasn't really as that much of a of a uh, of an accident. <laughs> I there, and the reason was that it started out from this this uh, the the project with the ice hockey players. Uh, people had actually been using the software the uh, uh, for a lot of different things. So. Evidently, there was an interest for this early on, even before Kentucky. And uh, what, but what happened was that I think the world wasn't really there yet. I mean, Kentucky is, is 11 years old now. You would not have been able to sell a light bulb that you could control from your phone in 2003. That would be, you know, people would have laughed at you <laughs> if you tried that. And what the guys are in life is did was, uh, now one and a half year ago, showed that they got a Kickstarter project up and running with more than 9,000 backers, more than 9,000 people uh, wanted to get, put their money out uh, uh, to get a light bulb that you can control from your smartphone. And so it was... You know, a completely different market in 2002 than it was in 2003, 
we can take it started. But but I, you know, I I've always had the uh, the idea was always to do something like this uh, to start a company at some point and do something real with this cool thing. But it wasn't the the, the world wasn't really yet ready. <laughs> the, the market wasn't there. Uh, uh, and now we're starting to see this this market uh, uh, emerging, or and it hasn't exploded yet, but it is is really on the verge of doing so. So we could say you invented the market for things on the internet, kind of. Well, well, uh, yeah, or or maybe uh, I guess not invented the market because it's hard to invent a market. A market would would sort of emerge by itself, but but having the technology there and and ready. Well, the market is, is surging, I think, is important. So that's, that's what, what we did. <laughs> well, I mean, kind of you, you created the future because um, in 2009 you were considered being one of the top um, 35 most important inventors under, under the age of 30. 35, yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, so... So you, so you are considered to, to be one of the most important inventors nowadays, just because yeah. of what you created here. Well, um, yeah. So, so what you are saying nowadays for people like me would be a kit or something? Well, I think the kits that we have are intended for, for really for, at this stage, for people who are, uh, let's say, uh, building in the first stages of building a connected product so they're not quite there yet uh, where you just pull it out and do something cool with it at, at this stage is still you take it out for the purpose of building a product with it but the next step and, and this is something that we're super excited about is uh, we're working together with hardware manufacturers uh, uh, all the big ones to uh, get these kits out in a more let's say, manageable fashion. Uh, the kits that we have are still, the, the cost is, is pretty high. Uh, you have to, uh, you have to, I, I think we're, we're right now selling them for, for uh, 495 euros. Uh, yeah, 495. What we're seeing is happening is the, the hardware, uh, once we can get the price of the hardware down so that you can get these and, and just get a kit and do something cool with it, uh, Connected to the internet, you have the Internet of Things kit, uh, and you're uh, just in your hands. What our software is doing, which I think is really cool, is it enables you to take out you open the box, and you have a set of wireless things. Whoa! A web browser. To and this would upload over the uh, over the internet directly to your device. Could and you could start that because you were you were not there for a minute. Oh, sorry. Could you repeat oh, your last your last two sentences maybe? Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. So what we're doing is is making this possible to just open the box, pull out your things, go to the website, and you have a set of, of example programs that you can click. The upload button it, it would download directly over the internet, and you would see your results immediately. So it's the idea of, of taking away a lot of the the hassle and hard work uh, and building a connected product and building a system that can be connected to your smartphone, can be connected to the to the internet, so you can access it from anywhere, or be connected just locally to your smartphone. You have all that uh, that uh, magical ability right there in your hands. And you don't even need to have, you don't even need to install software on your laptop. It's all um, in your browser. Um, just yeah. super convenient. Should we have a look at it? I, I, I already registered an account back then. Oh, you did? Yes. Yeah. Of course. Ex absolutely. <laughs> I, I prepared for the interview. Here we go. So hey, this great. is what we have here. This is my, um, my account on ThinkSquare. So could yeah. you explain to us a bit what we are seeing now? Right, so what we're seeing is to the left there, you have a, a set of buttons, and they're also repeated right on the screen. So develop, manufacture, run, the status. The uh, develop button is where you go to, uh, to develop your product. Here's where you write the software, the actual code, 
that you then upload and run to your system. And at this point, we don't have a device connected here. Uh, but if you had that, you could, could click there. So, so this is where you actually develop the uh, the code that your system would do. You do that right here on on your in your web browser. When you when you're happy with that, you can even take the uh, you could now take the same source code that you've developed here. You go to the manufacture tab, uh, the manufacture button on the left there. And you can download the software, the source code, even the the firmware binary image that you can just take to manufacturing and and uh, uh, take to production and then actually manufacture your device with that same source code, uh, doing the exact same thing that you saw being developed on your on your develop uh, tab button. So, so the idea is to make this very, very simple, the whole process of, of developing this prototype that you can even take to manufacturing. So if you look at the left hand side there, the buttons again, you have a run button. Now this is where you you actually run your system. You can you can even use this as a prototype for for developing your own uh, smartphone app or backend. So this one right here is a lighting system uh, uh, where you can set the red, green, and yellow uh, LED intensity of your your development board. And you can do that. You can group the devices. You can do things with them. Uh, uh, right here on the screen. We have a metering button on the top of the screen. If you're doing a smart meter system, you could use this this uh, uh, system right here to scan through. If you have thousands of, of smart meters, you could use the system to scan through them and collect their metering data. We have a sensors button uh, we, uh, right at the top there. Yes, this one shows the sensors reporting data from the development board. Again, this is this is an, an example of a system that you could do yourself. You could even use this one right, right here, but you'd normally use what's called the API. That's the uh, rightmost uh, button right there, which we haven't turned on yet. We don't have this public yet, but where you can access the same functionality, but through your own program. So you you typically develop this program as a smartphone app or on your backend server. You do the same things as you see on the uh, and the uh, system on screen here, but you can use that with, with your program instead and develop that uh, and integrate that with your own app. So to, if you look back to the left of the screen again, you have the uh, status button. Uh, now this isn't very fun right here just because we don't have any devices registered, but we'd see them all pop up here if we'd have some actual hardware connected. Uh, where you can update the firmware, uh, you have a button for updating the firmware at the top there. You have a map button showing where in the world they are located, and uh, that should be your your place that we should see there. Like again, you don't have yeah. any hardware, yeah. so shouldn't we don't see any uh, any hardware devices pop up? But they should be there if you'd had them. And again, we have the top of the screen. We have the network tab. So let's you look at the structure of the wireless network created by the devices. And uh, uh, again, we don't see much here because we don't have any hardware. Uh, but we have a map of the network. We have we can debug this, look at the history of, of, of status updates that they report back in. And uh, uh, again, we don't have any data, so it's not it doesn't show up here. And to the rightmost. Button. We have the power button where you can set different power modes and make the uh, system run for, for a long time on batteries by turning down the power mode, putting them in low power mode uh, where they may not be as responsive uh, but can live for a long time and still be connected. So that's pretty much the, uh, the uh, ThinkSquare uh, demo server as showing you what, what we can do with a connected device. Uh, as a as a the first thing you do, you just you just log in here and get started directly. And and build build up your own pro, uh, product this way, kind of. So, well, yes. If you're if you're building your product, you would use uh, you would typically use our backend server. You may not show this 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 what we see here to anyone. You might use this as a. Uh, uh, 
just using your smartphone app as the front end and have this in the background that no one would see. It would just be there to help you uh, with your, uh, uh, maintain your system, be having it up, up and running, doing firmware updates, uh, doing network debugging and automatic power modes, uh, and have that as a back-end system that supports your own product. So this is kind of an interface to program, control your 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 um, product, but but the but the product itself you would well control over a smartphone app, for example. Right. So you could see this as you could see this as a web server, uh, whereas your your web page is uh, what you see on your on your. Uh, in your web browser. So our system is running in the background. Uh, most users would not even know it's there. It's, it's just something that happens on, out on the big internet. Uh, but, but it delivers a lot of value to the uh, product manufacturer that can uh, make a smartphone app that works with their hardware. Great. So and actually, actually, not only this, um, your your well, how was it? Uh, micro, I am uh, internet protocol was also used in other products, not only for ThinkSquare, but oh sure, it, yeah, yeah, even even in um, in VNC client, for example, and the other stuff. Yes, it's it's the same system, the the same Contiki system in the background that. Makes all this come true. So, so is is things square? What we have here, um, the, your step to the future. But you are you are earning money also by well selling what you invented to other companies to use your your well your version of the spec. Well, that's right. Well, well <clears throat> what we're selling is the. Uh, cloud server software. We're actually giving away the, uh, the Contiki system. We're giving that away as open source and uh, so that anyone can use that. People contribute back their improvements and we get a much better system than what we'd have if we'd have, a, uh, if we'd have that uh, as, as part of the, the product that we sell. We, we actually open that up so that we have people contributing code from all around the world, making the system much, much better. It's actually a pretty complex thing, the Contiki system, so uh, having a, a group of, of top-class developers uh, looking at the system and, and adding code to it is a great strength. So you say one of your plans is to make the, the um, kit cheaper for people. What are your right. other plans for ThinkSquare? And for your new project and forthcoming development, <clears throat> right? So, so the the big plan here is to take what you're seeing here on screen and put that into pretty much everything around us. We want to make this the uh, software infrastructure of the future. I mean, if you're doing a connected product, which will be most of the products in the future, we'd like to see our our ThinkSquare system in the background. Uh, supporting this and empowering these, these systems. So there are a couple of, of killer apps or killer features that I think we're starting to see more of uh, enabled by this Internet of Things. So it's not just about connecting a smartphone app to a thing, but it's also about making products better and better, in continuous improvement of these products. And we have a number of examples of that where you'd have, as a product maker, you're designing your product, sending it out to people, and because you are able to have a connection to the product and a way to update its, its software, you can actually make a, 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 a quantified guess or, or sorry, a quantified uh, measurement of the, how good your product is and make improvements and actually test them live uh, as your product is out with your customers. You can test improvements and see if they actually improve the user experience. You can see if they actually improve the uh, how people perceive them as as consumers, and make better products without having to go through a whole uh, uh, lot of, of just educated guesses. You can actually test those, measure the results, and get back 
and have a better product next week. And I think that's one of the uh, one of the typical things that we will, we've started to see this, but it's it's no way near uh, full bloom yet. So if the goal is to make everything connected, everything through the internet, isn't there also a problem that is created by a privacy issue? Like like this could be used to control control what people do, what people use, and so isn't that also a big problem nowadays? Well, yeah, that's that's always uh, the the privacy issues is is very very. Uh, uh, big and I think it is, affects much more than what we are doing here. I think just the fact that you have a smartphone on you at all times is by itself a pretty, pretty uh, in terms of privacy, a, a pretty invasive thing. You, you have a, a microphone on you at all times. Uh, Google and Apple has a pretty good understanding of what you're doing all the time just because you're carrying this with you. Uh, uh, you're, and, and I think what we're doing here with the Internet of Things isn't necessarily adding much more to that than what we already have. Uh, uh, we, we, we're already there in terms of, of privacy and, and Google and Apple knowing a lot about us. That, uh, we're adding a little bit more here, certainly, but it's not, it's not, it's not a huge difference, I think, to what we're, we're, where we already are. So you, you took measurements? To avoid misuse of your product in a way. Well, we're we're making sure to have strong encryption so that you cannot you cannot listen in on the communication. Uh, we have encryption on on the radio layer, so you don't hear what's the actual what the actual radio message is being sent. We have encryption from the that was called end-to-end -end encryption from the device and all the way to the cloud server, and then again out onto the to the uh, uh, smartphone app, so that you can have. Uh, you're not being listening into uh, by the internet, so that's we are we are uh, taking the steps that we can do to make sure that uh, that we don't fall into traps in terms of, of security breaches. That's very good. Then, do you have any idea how many products are using your invitation so far? Well. Uh, it's hard to keep track of the open source software. I, I know that the open source software that that uh, I have developed for, uh, for the, the Kentucky and the the earlier stacks, are used. I I, I think it, some ten years ago I, I counted something like a hundred different products, but that was a ten years ago, and uh, I, I there is no way I can keep track of that since since then. Uh, for for ThinkSquare. Uh, even though we're, we're just one and a half years old now, we have at least hundreds of thousands of devices running our system and uh, more to come. But, but it's hard to keep track of the, of the uh, open source stuff. I see. So do you, do you consider yourself being an important person in nowadays future, or do you think this this hype that was around you in the last years and so on for being one of the well, top-notch inventors is highly overrated. What's your personal <laughs> uh, perspective about that? Well, I, 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 I'd like to, to make the things that I'm doing now to turn that into something that is very, very important for the future. And in doing that, I guess you, know, you, you pretty much automatically would become an important person from that. I think uh, so far, the, I, I've gotten a lot of recognition, and I'm, I'm very thankful for that. But I think that uh, much of that is more more of a future promise than a uh, sort of a, uh, a recognition for for great things accomplished. I, I, that's the way I see it, at least. I think there's this. I mean, we are still talking about something that is uh, early, very very early. We don't have we don't have everything around us connected yet. Uh, I'd like to to take a very active part in, in, in that future. And I think that's a very exciting thing because we were we will see our lives improving because of this, and uh, I hope to to be able to. 
take this this opportunity and, and really make something of that. But uh, it, it, we're still very very early yet. So so you you are more um, looking neutral to it and say let's see what's happening in the next five or ten years and then we can speak about it again if yeah. it becomes very important or not. Um, That's right. <laughs> well, I, I spoke to other in, inventors before and um, for example, last year to Russ Beer, who did the video home gaming thing and he, he said one of the next big things would be interactive television and interactive communication. Um, while others say that the world is more going towards um, the smartphone device and smartphone apps. So, what's what's your what's your take? What do you think um, will be will be the next big thing in the next ten years? Is it the Think Square thing, or is it something else you see you see coming towards us? Well, I, I think this this Internet of Things is definitely something that we're going to see much more of. I think the uh, smartphone apps combined with connectivity into the real world is is a very powerful concept that I think we're going to see a lot more of. Uh, you know, interactive TVs. You know, perhaps we might see things like interactive cars, all that. But uh, I, I don't know. It's it feels like the uh, smartphone and the smartphone apps is a revolution that is here to stay. And if we can connect that into the real world, we're doing something very, very large. But but isn't this isn't there also a problem if we are getting too technologized that we might lose control over everything? No, at some point? Do I don't think, think so. so. No, I think we are in control. I th I think what we had a an idea or, or a fear years ago. That technology would take over. I mean, if you look at at movies from from way back, you see this this fear being exploited as a uh, as excitement for for viewers. But I think what we have seen is that we are in charge of technology. I don't think that it's not going to take over. We are we are really in charge of this. That's how I see it. So you you don't have any fear. You are you are trying out and you think we are going to control this all. Yeah, definitely. That's interesting perspective. So I wish you good luck with your project and really very, um, I'm really very thankful we were able to interview you. Of course. Good. Of course. Good. Uh, okay. Thanks a lot. It's great to, to, to talk to you and thanks for having me. Thank you. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So thanks. Bye. So thank you. Good.